gorgeous. It is. I mean, what a pretty color yellow in this tree right behind us yeah. here. And that's a birch, river birch. River birch. Uh -huh. It's so nice to see that because my white paper birch trees said, I'm not changing my colors, and they just dropped their leaves. That's what you said. They must Angry. Have gotten really dry. Angry birch trees. You know, Mary, this is going to be, it's October. Already. Yeah. And I thought, you know, this might be a good time to talk about disappearances. Oh, that's right. This summer, we did a whole bunch of stuff, didn't yeah. we? We're going to talk about famous disappearances in this county. And Trumbull County has a bunch of them here, yeah. folks. I mean, a lot more than what I ever knew. So we're just going to talk about four, mainly. And, you know, disappearances are, it's terrible. It's, it's like one minute the person is there, and then the next minute they're not. It's just like, poof, where did they go? You know, people disappear. Animals disappear, people's pets disappear. Yes, they do. And there's mm. always left a sense of wonder. Wondering yeah. what happened, what went on, where did they go? Was there sneaky stuff involved? You, you don't know, and that's what's you so don't hard. Know. There isn't any closure. No. Yes. And like I say, there it's just it's it's hard on people because they're they're just you don't know. Now the four that we're gonna talk about, two of them were baffling disappearances, but they were eventually solved. Okay. There's one that we talked about earlier that might have been solved, but we'll never be able to know probably. Not for sure anyway. Not definitively. And the fourth one is, is still, this happened back in 1926, and it's still a cold case. I wonder if they, we could, you know, drum up some business to get, like, the cold case files yeah. people in to come start doing some digging in Trumple County. I don't, it, it was such a sensational story. It got play on the newspapers all over the country. Oh, Nancy, the suspense is just building. <laughs> It is just building. I, I'm so intrigued by where we are going with this edition of the History, History Files. Files. And this will be a special Mystery Files. Yes. <laughs> Those are my favorite. Yeah. <sighs> so we're going to start out talking about two gentlemen that disappeared. And uh, both of them had a connection to Whitehall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So we'll start out and we'll talk about them. <laughs> so we're going to talk about these four disappearances. And we're going to get on the road and do that. That sounds great. We get mysteries, histories, and a road trip. You bet. Nothing better. And away we go. Nice October evening. It's October. Yep. Look at no long johns, no sweatshirts, <laughs> no hats, no gloves. This is crazy. And we are up above. This is Whitehall behind us, in case you don't know. And we're going to start on number one disappearance. We have disappearances. Yes. This number one was a, na a man by the name of John Eagleson. Okay. John Eagleson. Yes. And when did John disappear? Disappear. When did he go missing? January 8th, 1984. Was oh, so okay. this is a early current day, right, sort of. Right. This is way not hundreds of years ago. Okay. This is a more current person. And he was 69 years old and he was unemployed. He was living off his social security and he was living in a trailer at Stuvie's Trailer Court. Okay, I remember where that trailer park yeah. was. And it's not there anymore, is it? No, no, the driveway's still there. And I want to say they had maybe four units. It wasn't huge. No, no. no. So that night he left a tavern, uh, I think it was called the Three Strike Tavern. 
Larson Strike Three. Okay, Larson. That's Patty right. Patty and Jimmy Larson's okay. bar for the people who are familiar <laughs> with Whitehall. Larson's Strike Three, which is back by Rudy's Pontiac, where they do like the auto fixing. Yeah. On one of the back streets. Okay. He had been there that evening, and he left. And the last person that saw him that evening saw him by the IGA store. Oh, okay. And then, poof! He was gone. He was gone. They looked for him. Of course, he was a bachelor living by himself, but he disappeared. He did not come back to his trailer. Isn't that crazy? January 8th. And his mother, Helene, was here in Whitehall in the nursing home, and he had a sister, Cora, who was down in Janesville. Okay. But he just disappeared. Huh. And nobody knew what happened to him. And so they tried searching all the boxcars, empty boxcars. Do, do they know, Nancy, was he having libations the evening when he left? Well, if he left the tavern, there's a good chance that he did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was it. January 8th disappeared. And... Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to drive down into Whitehall, Whitehall and talk about a little bit more about Mr. John Eagleson, but he was the first of our disappeared people. Yes. On, and our, on our list. Yes, yes, <laughs> Mr. Eagleson. So we are going to get back in the car and we're going to go down into Whitehall and check out the path where someone disappeared. Yep. What did you call it? Strike three? Larson strike three. Okay. Um, the last place that he had, he left there that night. The last time he was... Well, somebody oh. saw him by the IGA that night. But okay. That was, but he was, had left Larson strike three. Okay, so this, the facility, uh, the establishment has a different name now, but this is the place where... The doghouse? It's the doghouse oh, now. Oh, okay. And now, previously, it was owned by a couple of different families. Um, and if we go back to Mr. Eagleson's time, it would have been Larson Strike 3. Okay. All right, so... So that's, this is one city block. Yeah. Okay, and he was last seen in the vicinity oh, of IGA. Yep. Oh, this is a pretty sky, Nancy, and we're yeah. driving right into the sun, so I'm not sure how this is going to turn out. I got a lot of glare. Okay, so now here is city block number two and most everyone's familiar with the grocery store which is now Randy's but at the time it would have been Cliff Burr's IGA okay so that's our second city block right okay so he was last seen in the vicinity of here IGA okay okay and so if we take a right hand turn down this street then we can kind of roughly count on this off the off the right hand side uh, maybe another city block where the road is and keep going to where Stuvie's trailer is. Oh, okay. Okay. And so we will we'll go up here and we'll come back down Dewey Street. Yeah, because then we can get better sun. But I did have people tell me that they remembered. Mr. Eagleson. Okay. That he was kind of uh, a tall guy and okay. he would walk around 
wearing a cowboy hat. Oh, okay. Okay, so they did remember him. But then he just... Disappeared. Disappeared. Well, and you know, our tight communities, people are going to notice something like that right away. So yeah. do you know, did people start looking for him right away? or? Well, like I said, they were looking for him and they were uh, going through uh, boxcars over there on, okay. the, on the siding and uh, no luck. But now this is when the story kind of moves along here a little bit. Okay. Now, it was the end of February 1984, and so that would have been about two months after Mr. Eagleson went missing. And I believe there had been a path at one time that went kind of here. Yes. It, it kind of went across the railroad tracks from the IGA um, over to where the old high school was. Am yes. I correct? Correct. Okay. Well, Roderick Everson was coming back. I, I don't know which way he was going, but he saw uh, a shirt, a piece of a shirt, which caught his attention. But now you pick up the story because you were in high school when something happened. I was in yeah. high school. Um, if I remember correctly, okay, it, we had open lunch. One of the pathways came through this property, which at the time was Joe and Evelyn Maldonado's property. And Joe had, these were his two bike sheds down here. And the, the lunch bell rang, everybody funneled back into school. And all of a sudden there were lights and there was sirens. And we were on the north side of it, Mr. Stearns, and he had the big windows, Nancy, the big jumbo windows. And pretty soon there was a whole pile of people right alongside this little white shed. Oh, the little white shed. Okay. The little white shed. Okay. And of course, high school being high school, it spreads like wildfire that they had found a dead guy <laughs> and when when the they okay who found him who found him it was an upperclassman by the name of Dan Peterson and he took this path home over lunch hour to go home have lunch and then he'd walk back through well how the story goes is that he saw a glove he saw a glove. He saw yeah. a glove okay. kind of peeking through the snow. Because if you look at this building, the snow would have shed probably right on top of this person, right? So he was down close to the shed. Yes. And uh, they had to, they, I, I distinctly remember that they used, because you can see the steam. They had to use warm water, okay, and he was found alongside this building. Under the snow? Under, he was buried in the snow. But enough of it had probably melted by that time that the glove. glove was sticking out. Yep. You know? So, Mr. Eagleson was found. He apparently had slipped or, or had sat down or something on the night that he was coming back because they said he was only about a hundred yards from his trailer. Yeah, that's not that far yeah. from here. He just never made it the rest of the way. But this was a disappearance that was solved. Yay! All right, Mary, we're going to talk about our second disappearance. The second missing person. And this happened in 1993. Okay, 93. In Whitehall. And Boy, Whitehall has a, they're losing people, man. <laughs> Whitehall, get it together. And the gentleman that disappeared was Albert Misch. Okay, Albert Misch, that name's familiar. Right. He was originally from Arcadia area. 
And he was a very talented welder and could do fabrication. And uh, he was interested in a lot of things. Okay. He would stop by our place and visit with my husband because at one time, I think Albert had had bees, so oh, he would okay. stop by. Now, was he ever a farmer in his life? Um, he, I think he might have been born to a farming family. Oh, okay. Yeah, but he really seemed to do welding and, and fabricating. A very interesting person, very intelligent. And I have a clipping here, and I'll have to read it to you because it turns out that in the year of, uh, let's see, what year was that? In June 29th, 1945, he was awarded a Bronze Star. Oh, so he was a veteran. He was in the Army, and he had been stationed in England. And according to this uh, article, it said that um, Staff Sergeant Albert J. Misch had invented several devices which speeded up the processing of parts for flying fortresses. Ooh, the big ones, yep, the big at boys. The e at the Air Depot in England. It said he's a machinist in a department which manufactures and reconditioned parts for battle-torn B-17s. Wow, that's pretty impressive. A yeah. bronze. And didn't they just usually give those for, for, like, for battle like ground. Bat yeah, yeah. Yep. For like fighting the, the good fight right. and saving all your men. But it said among his inventions was an exhaust stack flange finisher. Wow, that's a mouthful. <laughs> Holy cats. Yeah. Which increased five times the number of flanges his department was able to recondition. And he was awarded the machinist, machinist technician badge for exemplary work. Wow. And formerly he had been a welder for the Halberg brothers and he had been overseas for 32 months. Wow, so he did a long tour. Yeah, he did. And he made it back alive. Yes, and, and what he was noted for was he was able to help recondition these airplanes, the airplanes so they could get back up in the air. And that's a huge deal because yes. we lost we lost a lot of yeah. we lost a lot of airplanes in those days. So he was 85 in 1993. Okay. And he had uh, moved into Whitehall uh, to the Riverside Trailer Tell and was living there. Okay. And then he went missing on November 2nd. Why does everybody go and missing in the times of the year when the weather's going to be bad, Nancy? And I think I just said it wrong. It was 1994, not 1993. Okay, bad. 94. Anyway, 19, <laughs> 1994. Oh. He was last seen, um, and that was uh, in November 2nd. Okay. And um, he had asked a neighbor in the trailer tell for directions on how to get to Blair. To get to Blair? Yes, and the last thing that this neighbor saw was him walking down 53 towards Blair. Oh, so, okay, Highway 53, yes. which takes us right to Blair. So it makes you think he probably had maybe a little bit of confusion going on. Okay. And I remember that he used to drive around the neighborhood, usually in a small truck, or I think he had like a small motorcycle, motor scooter thing at one time as well. But lots of times they said that he would park his vehicle and he would get out and walk. He liked to walk. Okay. So the last he was seen was heading out of town towards Blair. Well, his relatives came to check on him. And when they went to his trailer, they found that all the lights were on and the radio like he had just stepped out. Okay. And I'm sure they thought, well, maybe he went to the grocery store yeah. or someplace close, maybe? They did not see him. Well, then the rumors just started flying. Yes. Somebody said they saw him getting on a bus in Blair heading for Florida. What buses would be Well, they had coming? buses back then, remember? Uh, well, I know <laughs> buses, but Blair and going to Florida, yeah. that's, you know, that I don't think Greyhound came through Blair, did they? There was a bus service, and, oh, okay. and they, they swore that, somebody swore that he got on the bus there. Somebody else said that no, that he had gone to visit a girlfriend, but oh, they weren't sure at where. At 85. There were a lot of theories out there about oh, I what happened to him. I bet. And they, but he was not seen. It wasn't until the spring of 1995 
when um, a farmer above um, Welsh Cooley, just kind of over the hill from here, was out working on his line fence in the spring. Oh boy. And I'm not sure I like where this story is well, going. They found human remains there against the fence line. Oh no. Yeah. Really? And it turned out that it was Mr. Mish. It was Albert Mish. Oh, so he wandered and got lost. And yeah. And didn't uh, work out. then there was theories about why, how he wound up there because he would have come all the way up Welsh Cooley. And, and that's a long coolie. And gone through a real swampy area to wind up where he was found. So um, we'll talk about, uh, we'll take a little drive and we'll talk about the theory of where they think he was going. But at least he was found. And the family was able to put him to rest. Yes, they had some closure because he was buried in the St. Stan Cemetery there. In Arcadia. In Arcadia. All right, let's just what go down the road. What a tragic end yeah, for well, our disappearances. I know, but he was found at least. There we go. Okay. Okay, Mary, behind us is what was the Mish farm. That's why we went into a direction where I was confused as to where we were going. <laughs> she wouldn't give me the details. She likes the suspense. Well, I like to keep Mary on her edge. <laughs> but they figure that Albert Mish was coming, was headed toward his home place, which is right behind me here on Square Bluff. Okay. That was the Mish farm. And uh, that was the theory that he was trying to find his way back to his his boyhood farm. Wow, but Nancy, that is such a long way. I know. Even as the crow flies, it's not like one no, valley I over know, or I know. so. And for him to have been found where he was, he already had gone a long way. Wow, that is just yeah. incredible. Yeah. And at least he was found. Yes, the least, again, there was closure for the family. And it was sad because he was a very, very intelligent man. Very and, accomplished. Yes, very accomplished, interested in a wow. lot of things. But at least he was found. Exactly. And there was some closure. There you go. <laughs> no matter what we do, we're not going to win. <laughs> it's a windy day. Sunglasses off. Yep. Yep. We're trying to make this a perfect one. So, Mary, it is a freaky warm day in October. It is 83 degrees with a very warm southerly breeze. I don't know what's going on here, Nancy. The <laughs> lilacs are blooming. It's a crazy... It's a crazy weather time. So we're going to talk about number three, disappearance. Oh, we're going on disappearances again. Yes, number three. And we're in Independence because it was related to Independence. That's where this disappearance comes from. And speaking of relations, uh, today we're going to be talking about Edward Jellin. And Mary has a special connection to Edward Jellin. After uh, Nancy <laughs> did some digging and some calls to my sister Robin down in Sun Prairie and some calls that she made out to my aunt, Andreen, Mary Andreen Elstead Sasala, uh, this is my great-great-grandfather right. who is the disappearance out of independence. And this happened, this isn't recent, this happened back in October of 1918. Yes. And Edward Jellin was 70 years old, and he was an interesting guy, Mary, because he had come here from Poland with his first wife, and she was Mary Rumpel from home. Okay. And they had a family, but unfortunately his wife died in 1873, and then Edward, when he got older, he remarried a lady by the name of Victoria Fila, and she had also come here from Poland. Okay. 
She came in, in 1885, and she had a son, Peter, that Edward, when he married Victoria, he uh, was like his stepson then. Okay. And Edward was retired, and they were living on 10 acres outside of Independence. We don't know exactly where. And it seemed like everything was fine in his life. And Victoria went to visit with some other ladies, and when she came home, Edward wasn't there, but she didn't get excited. She just thought, you know, he went uptown. Right, right. But he didn't come home all night. Oh, that's a problem. Yes, and um, he, they finally decided they better start looking for him because he was 70 and it was October, and I think it was a lot cooler than it is right now. Oh, probably. Yeah. But they couldn't find him. He disappeared. <laughs> What a saga! And well, there were a couple of, of theories. Well, stories, sightings, supposedly. Oh, sightings. Okay. There were some railroad railroad workers, you know, like section hands, and they s claim they saw a gentleman walking down the road. Okay, about okay. the time that he disappeared. Okay. And then there was uh, um, somebody down by Marshland. You know where that is? Down on your way to Winona. Yep. They claimed they saw an older person walking, and somebody else said, no, they saw him in Tremplo at the railroad depot. Hopping a train car <laughs> and running away from home. Except he was 70 years <laughs> old. <laughs> so I don't know how hopping the train car works when you're 70. Um, but, you know, from Independence to Winona, especially in that time period, that would take days and days and well, days to it'd walk. be a lot of walking, yes, from Independence. So there were all these rumors about sightings, but none of them ever panned out. And his stepson, Peter, and uh, Edward had a, uh, must have been a son-in-law, a Machosik, and a couple others. They went looking for him in Winona. They thought okay, maybe he went to Winona to visit relatives. Okay. Okay. But it seemed kind of unlikely that he wouldn't have said anything to his wife. Or that he wouldn't have taken her with and they wouldn't have used a different mode of transportation because I would assume that would have normally been a train ride. Probably, yeah. Yes. So they, uh, the family was very upset so then they offered a reward uh, to find Edward or for news and they offered $50 and now we think, ah, they didn't care bucks. about him. Fifty bucks. That's uh, you know, a couple days groceries. Maybe he ex had an accident in the backyard <laughs> for fifty bucks. You know, wow. But fifty dollars back then was worth a lot more. Oh yes, yeah. definitely. So we definitely. can't make fun of their offer, but they never found him again. But now this plot thickens a little bit, doesn't it? Well, like I say, there were rumors, and, and you said that you had heard a rumor. Well, in, in trying to research this information, it was discovered that some of the talk about town was that Edward had fallen on some hard financial times and really couldn't see a way out. And after, again, more phone calls, it was, no, 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 that was not the case. There wasn't any issue there. I think he just wandered off and yeah. got... Well, and we don't know if he had a little bit of confusion going on. It said people in the family hadn't noticed it. Right. So it was a big question mark. What happened to Edward Jellin? And this being October and cooler, you, you can't... Do you think that he would have been out all night walking or, or what? It just probably didn't happen. Well, and chances are they didn't have the lighting systems that we have today. So how would you maneuver yeah. in the dark? There, there's a lot of, of, of roadblocks here. <laughs> but you had a couple of theories about well, what happened to him. Well, you know, She's I... She's got a weird mind. I, I seem to always <laughs> fall back on that. He fell in the swamp and the animals got him. The animals ate him. Well, I'm sure <laughs> in that time period there was a lot more predators. Big ones that we have today. But you never know, Nancy. The Sasquatch could have got him or... You know, maybe his wife had had enough and... But you said also, you thought a bull got him. Oh, well you never know. If you're maneuvering cross country, 
bulls in pastures right? Farmers have hurt and killed a lot of people over history, probably more than we'll ever know. And then, of course, after you get killed, then, of course, the animals come in and then the evidence is all gone. So those are all the rumors and theories that went around about Edward Jellin. However, there was a new kink to this whole story, and we'll talk about that. Okay, Mary, we are still in the vicinity of independence. We are, we are. And you know, one of the theories is I wonder if maybe he fell into the Trumplow River. Which is right behind us. Which is right behind us. And as we know, rivers, depending on the year, sometimes they get a little, maybe he took a shortcut and tried to cross and slipped on a rock and fell and hit his head. But as we move forward in history, Something very, very interesting happened. Um, maybe, we're guessing, we're spinning a theory. And what was that, Nancy? Well, like I say, there's a little kink in this whole story. There's the kink. In 1921, two boys over in the town of Glencoe by uh, Arcadia. Down river from where we're at. They were crossing uh, a meadow. Okay. They were going to go down to the Tremplow River and swim. And guess what they found? What did they find? A skull, a human skull. A human skull? <laughs> yes. I bet you a dollars to donuts that was Edward, because what are the chances? <laughs> well, now this was several years after he had disappeared, and the farm owner of that meadow said that he had seen that skull out there for quite a while, but he just thought it was like, you know, animal bones. Oh, okay, like a cow bone or, yeah. you know, something like that. And the, the theory is that, of course, um, when the river got high, that it, water would have washed into this meadow area. Okay, and so then that goes along what I was thinking, where he fell in the river, clonked his head, and maybe in the spring melt, he ended up down by Glencoe. That's a long ways from here down to Glencoe oh, on a yeah. river. Well, <laughs> it is. It is. Especially with all the wild animals in Trumple County. <laughs> I mean, really. You, we just never know because this has never been solved. Well, this was 1921, so they couldn't run it in for forensics or DNA testing. No, but I wonder if we could find that skull or if they just... You know, uh, yeah, we put don't, it in the burn barrel. We don't know. We don't know if the family decided that was Edward and, and, you know, buried it. We don't know. But this was the little kink in the whole disappearance. He was never found proven anyway. Proven. Right. But either that or else there's another mystery that no one knows about in our Yeah, community. I mean, if it wasn't Edward's skull, who was it? Well, exactly. No <laughs> one else was missing that we're aware of. Although, a lot of people moved around in those days. There was no interstate. There was no GPS to keep track of your loved ones. So we have to say our third disappearance was not probably solved. Correct, correct. Okay. So now we're going to go and talk about our number four disappearance and this one has never been solved. Never been solved and this one is a whopper. It is. This is going to be <laughs> exciting. You are never going to guess. It's downright lurid. Down here into uh, Galesville. Wow, that was a white knuckler, man. Nancy was flying down the highway. I was so fired up Not and scared. Enough. We're taking a nice fall drive. We got We're talking about our. 
appearance and that is the one that is the most sensational and it really had uh, a lot to do with Galesville so it's a real it's a, a, a like I said it's a lurid story it made the newspapers all over the country even the New York newspapers ran really? the story yes it was huge so uh, the person that disappeared was a young man he was 18 years old and his name was Erdman Olson and he was from uh, the Viroqua area his parents Viroqua? Yep. Wait a minute we're in Galesville. Yep. His parents uh, had made quite a success of, of growing tobacco down in, in uh, down by Viroqua. I think they actually lived in Crawford County and Erdman was kind of the privileged child. He, uh, they said he was always had nice clothes, was well groomed, and, and had spending money. But he was kind of a rip, to put it. Okay, what's a rip? Well, he just got into a lot of trouble. Huh? A naughty boy. Yeah. So they had sent him up here to Gale College, which this was happening in 1926. Okay, now let's just one sidebar was Gale College an actual college yes. or like a secondary no it was a college college okay it was a co small college and in 1926 when Erdman Olson was a student there it was being run by the Lutherans so it was a what they call a good Lutheran school a good Lutheran school yes okay and I imagine that they thought that um, maybe it would help her to clean up his act a little bit because he had a probably would get into trouble and in fact he had been expelled from Gale College earlier <laughs> in the spring of 1926 but the, Nancy. The, the parents somehow managed to get him back in for the fall term and they said that he he just uh, he caused problems he, he got into a fight and uh, he just had some other behavioral issues. His classmates said that he was aloof. Oh. And that might be another word for uh, being a, kind of a jerk. <laughs> okay. He didn't sound like a real nice person anyway. Okay, so Erdman had behavior problems. He did. And he got shipped off to Gales. <laughs> Wait, did they have a dormitory here? Yes, did right? they? Right ahead of us, see that red brick building? Okay. That yeah. is a dormitory. Okay. And then there's also another dormitory with a lighter colored brick right behind uh, Old Oops. Main here. It's, you probably can't see it right now. It's okay, you can Main. roll down your window and then we'll shoot Old Main. That's a beautiful building. Yeah. So this was a nice setting and it was conservative, but Erdman was kind of uh naughty it some, yeah it was naughty So Mary, right now we are sitting in front of Old Main, and that was uh, one of the big buildings down here at the Gale University. In 1926, it was run by the Lutherans. Okay. Erdman Olson was a student here. He was 18 years old. Well, September 10th, 1926, a young girl from the Viroqua area by the name of Clara Olson. So she too was from Viroqua. Right. Okay. Uh, she went missing. Oh, I oh. thought we were talking about Erdman. Well, 
We are. Okay, okay. <laughs> because it does get kind of messy here. Uh -oh. Okay. <laughs> oh no. Okay. She went missing. And it turned out that Erdman had been going around with her for a while, for about a year. Okay, did she go missing from Verolkwar yes. or from Galesville? No. No. Okay. From she actually lived about six miles from Erdman Olson. Uh, back there. Okay. They're, they're actually near the community of Rising Sun. But oh, I know where that yeah. is. Okay. Uh, it turned out that she and Erdman had been going to dances and a few things. Spending time together? Yes. Uh, quality time, I guess, that she thought. But Erdman was uh, bragging to his buddies that, uh, that he was not, you know, he was just having a lot of fun oh. with her. Okay. Oh, so a miss right now versus a miss right yes Sis, right yep and okay. she she went missing now clara olson and urban were not related okay so two different olson right because there were a lot of Norwegians. a lot of Olsons. yes <laughs> <laughs> but she went uh she went totally missing and they couldn't find her and they couldn't find her and there were all kinds of theories. Some people said that, oh, she'd probably run off to the big cities or, you know, she'd gone off with some boyfriend or something. Right, right. And Erdman said he didn't know where she went. And the father of, of Clara, of course, their family, it was a larger farm family. They right. had eight or nine kids. They were extremely distraught. Now, according to one of the uh, newspaper accounts, it said that uh, Chris Olson, the father of Clara, had a dream oh. where he saw his daughter's grave was a shallow grave. Now, we don't know if that was just something that the newspaper made up because they did that all the time back right. then. They right, made right. up all kinds of stuff to sell papers. But anyway, in December, uh, Chris Olson and a bunch of neighbors, they did go looking uh, around you know, the area. Around where the neighborhood? They, right, yes. And somebody saw a pair of uh, looked like shoes sticking out of the dirt. Oh, brother, here we go. And they did uncover, they found that Clara was buried in a shallow grave. Oh, my goodness. And the autopsy showed uh, that she had been beaten very badly. Oh, no. And she was six months pregnant. Oh, the plot thickens. Yes. And they said that they found on her a letter that she had said that she and uh, Erdman were going to run off together and get married and, and all this. Oh, do you think he drew her out of her home with a ploy? Well, Clara's sister said that the night that she went missing, that she had left the house quite late and that they had heard a car and... Uh, Clara has said, don't worry, I'll be back. And so they think that that was when she went off with Erdman. And, and they were going to run away. And they met their, she met her end, which was terrible. So did they, have, did they catch him? Did they put him in jail? No, because okay. suddenly this, this. he went missing. Erdman just disappeared from the face of the earth. Well... I don't know what to say here, Nancy. We've got a dead pregnant girlfriend right. in a shallow grave right. found by her friends and family. Right. And all of a sudden, he's gone. Did dad? Yeah, well, there gonna... were all kinds of rumors. And poor Clara, they did bury her. And, uh, you know, they had a good funeral. But, of course, her family, to say that they were distraught was probably, you know, an making understatement. Yeah, very much an understatement. Because they not only lost her, but in discovering her in the shallow grave, right. they also lost another family a member. A grandchild, right. Um, so it, there were so many rumors I mean, you wouldn't, I found them in the paper, slugs of rumors. Rumors that said that actually uh, Chris Olson had probably murdered Well, Erdman. wouldn't that? Uh, <laughs> he had a motive. I hate <laughs> he to definitely. say that. Wouldn't that be the next logical step? But you hear about that. Yeah. Someone murders he and then. certainly had a motive. The eye for an eye kind of a thing. 
And then four different times, supposedly, Erdman was seen in the Twin Cities. Okay. And so all the police up there were looking for him, but they never found him. Okay. Then somebody, they had a, a suspect down by Milwaukee that they thought was Erdman Olson, but it wasn't. But then a psychic from down on the Milwaukee area claimed that Erdman was uh, dead and buried in a grave somewhere. Oh. By a big tree. By a big tree. So <laughs> yeah. then that would kind of lean over towards Christ being the culprit, right? Well, Otherwise it wouldn't have been in a shallow grave. Right. So um, he, they, they said that Clara went missing on September 22nd and Erdman disappeared uh, September 27th and was never seen again. Wow. So he disappeared before they found her. Well, and we, when we were driving into town, if I recollect, you told me that he came from a wealthy family. Yes, they so were do fairly you think, wealthy. Do you think they put a wig on him and made him look like a girl and threw him on a train <laughs> and sent him, you know, sent him off? There, like I say, there were so many rumors and, and theories about what happened to him. It was so sensationalistic. All like newspapers, like I said, way out on the East oh Coast in Chicago were running this story. And uh, people were looking for Erdman. Do, pictures of Erdman? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. There wow. were pictures of him. A thousand dollar reward was oh, offered. Well, that's a lot more than my great great grandpa. Fifty. Well, that's true. Fifty bucks. That's true. And what time difference was that? This was maybe, 1926. Yeah. Maybe he should have went missing a couple of decades later. Well, that could have been. But it was a, a huge scandal. And so, now, did they find him in South America or somewhere? He was never seen again. Never seen again. And uh, wow. my mother, now in 1926 when this happened, my mother would have been about four years old. Okay. But she remembered hearing about this as a, really? probably into the 30s. And uh, people were still talking Talk about, about it. Erdman Olson and how he disappeared. And uh, she said wow. people were all saying he went into the underworld. He went into the underworld. Oh, so did he get a job with the mafia or well, something? Well, what was the, the organized <laughs> crime or whatever? But they, he was never seen again. So there was no closure. And of course, this whole thing was so terrible for for Chris Olson and right. and the Erdman Olson's parents as well. They followed his mother around the press. Really? She went to uh, Prairie du Chien one day, and the press were just hounding her. That poor woman. Yeah, so, um, you know, lots of times people talk about, you know, the media these days being so terrible and slanted. Believe me, back in the 1920s, <laughs> there was no rules. You they made up stuff. down as well. Right, right. And the uh. story was also put out there that Chris Olson had offered uh, Erdman, if he would marry Clara, that... He would give him some cows and some land. Set them up. And set them up. And Erdman just blew them off. But we don't know if that's true or not. Well, and you know, what a sad story, Nancy. Oh, it's very sad. And, and it, I was hoping you were going to say, <laughs> and they found him. No. You know, because we have found people on our disappearance right. show. We, we haven't. I mean, people have been right. found. Right. Mr. Oh. Eagleson and Mr. Mish and maybe your great-great-grandpa. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're not we, certain. We don't know about that for sure. But Erdman was never found, and it, it kind of cast uh, a stigma on the college here, because this is where he'd been going to oh. school. Although they, of course, said, well, we didn't have anything to do with it. Well, right. And, I mean, if they had prior expelled him right. for behaving badly, who knows yeah. really what he was doing. Yeah. But, and I, I highly doubt in, in the day a young pregnant woman would have gotten in a car with a stranger and snuck away in the night well then, right yeah and I this mean, other this is a weird one this other story came out in the paper that the night that she had left supposedly with erdman erdman had a mysterious stranger with him and the mysterious stranger is the one that probably killed, uh, killed clara and maybe killed erdman they don't know well if he was a loafer that was aloof maybe he didn't want to get his hands dirty it, it's just we don't know and oh i guess goodness. we won't 
Now, if you're really interested in this story, there is a book for sale on Amazon about this murder. You would just have to Google Erdman Olson and, and you'd see it. Now, is it Olson with an S-E-N or an O-N? Uh, it's an S-O-N. S-O-N. Yeah. Okay. So you get the spelling right. Right. So, but that concludes our disappearances. And like I say, we had two that they found. Yay! One, yeah. And one that never did. And one that was just a tragic ending. Right, right. Nobody was happy. So, anybody out there, if you have a grandpa named <laughs> Erdman <laughs> Olson in your lineage, get a hold of us. That's because right. Because there's a plot behind that story. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on... The History, History Files. Files. This was a Mystery Files Disappearances. Special episode. Special episode. <laughs> oh, that's kind of nice. Now we got pine needles falling. Yeah, I asked you to find me a tree that had leaves coming out, and I guess a pine yeah. will do. It is fall, and there they come down. So this was just a huge sensational story wow yeah. national press yeah i mean there was articles in the new york times and everything wow. it was a nationwide scandal <laughs> that is just incredible and that's not what poor Yale college wanted to be noted for in any connection you know they were a good lutheran school yeah well and to have a college in a really a small rural town right. was a major yeah. major deal yeah it was a small college but it had a, a reputation as being a good college you know small but right, very right. good unreal and then they get some real negative publicity here crazy running around <laughs> typical of Trumbull county they import crazy yeah they do um, yeah more or less he was not really